Philip Glass is one of the most recognized and recognizable American composers in the world today. His compositions have had and continue to have an enormous impact on the contemporary classical musical world. In this video, I'm going to focus on an analysis of his first etude for piano. Philip Glass was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1937, where his father owned a record store and his mother was a school teacher. He studied philosophy at the University of Chicago, where he received a bachelor's degree in philosophy and mathematics. Afterwards, he applied for Juilliard, auditioning for performance in flute, which he more or less failed. However, one of the auditors suggested that he take composition lessons through their extension program, which he did. After Juilliard, he went to Paris, where he studied under the famed pedagogue Nadia Boulanger. Glass was one of the leading members of the American minimalist movement in music, along with composers such as Terry Riley and Steve Reich, and today is considered one of the founding composers of that musical movement. With his operatic trilogy, Einstein on the Beach, Akhenaten, and Satya Grahara, composed from the mid-1970s into the early 1980s, Glass almost single-handedly brought back opera as a major musical genre, his output is huge, with numerous operas, symphonies, con concerti, and string quartets to his credit. In recent years, he has worked mostly within the more traditional concert music repertory, with over ten symphonies to his credit, while retaining, refining, and expanding much of his earlier musical language. Since the beginning of his compositional career, Glass has written many works for the piano. Glass's etudes may stand out as his major contribution for that instrument. Composed over an 18-year period, from 1994 to 2012, the etudes found themselves immediately admitted to the standard repertory. There are 20 etudes in the collection, two volumes of 10 etudes each. These etudes are written as principally pedagogical works, and many of them are written for Glass himself. Initially, Glass wrote the first six etudes for Dennis Russell Davies and Achim Fryer on the occasion of Davies' 50th birthday. Dennis Russell Davies is a conductor who has been a long-standing champion of Glass's uh, compositions. He premiered uh, Satya Hagra in Stuttgart, and Achim Fryer was the impresario and director for, the, for whom the first original six etudes were written. Davies also commissioned Glass's first symphony, which Glass undertook at the age of 54. And then Glass composed an additional four etudes for himself to develop his own piano technique and continue composing more etudes, and of course the rest is history. Glass's etudes have become an instantaneous success in the concert hall, and thus an immediate classic. The complete etudes have been recorded by numerous pianists, including Vikingur Olofsson, Anton Batagov, Jenny Lynn, Sally Whitwell, and many others. Thus it appears that the etudes have worked their way into the standard repertoire and will remain there for quite some time. Today, I'm going to focus on the first etude. First of all, let me say this. Though Glass is more popularly considered to be a minimalist composer, this is not entirely accurate, at least as far as the etudes are concerned. While he was one of the founding members of the School of Minimalism in America, minimalism as a musical aesthetic began to wane somewhat in the early 1980s, and the etudes are what would be more accurately called post-minimalist. So what's the difference between the two? So, minimalism has a lack of goal-directed melodies or harmonies. That is to say, the music has strong geometrical designs orally and it has sharp lines. Traditionally in Western music, uh, one of the features that melodies ought to have is they should be fairly linear and they should also be fairly stepwise with a, you know, a fairly smooth structure. And you don't really find that in early minimalist works. Uh, think of Terry Riley's in C, for example. Also, minimalism has repetitive harmonic sales, usually highly diatonic, and again, without a sense of goal direction. They're not leading to any particular kind of uh, place in terms of a cadence, um, and they're not taking you anywhere either. They're just moving on their own accord, almost like um, automatic music. There's also an issue in of chromaticism. Like I said, the pieces are highly diatonic. There's very little uh, sense of chromaticism as in late romantic or modernist works and so these works have a 
they sound square almost uh, when you when you think about it and because of these features they lack tension and release that we come to normally associate with romantic music or even with more highly modernist music um, even into the second Viennese school for example so while minimalism has those qualities, post-minimalism also has them, but there are, some, there are some salient differences. For example, in post-minimalism, we see the reintroduction of melodic form, as we see melodies reintroduced into the musical fabric. There's also a kind of minimal tonal function. It's not out of character for a post-minimalist piece to have what sounds like, and what appears on the surface anyway, to have sort of tonal functions, such as 5-1 relationships. That is to say, a, a phrase begins with a one, gravitates to the five, and then ends back with a with a with a with a with a with a So there's minimal tonal function, and there's also minimal chromatic coloring. We see the reintroduction of chromatic coloring uh, outside of the diatonic structures that um, feature in minimalist compo compositions. There's also a greater use of dynamics. And in general, uh, move away from these strict geometrical structures towards greater fluidity of style. So it's important to emphasize that the two are not necessarily opposed to one another, and that post-minimalism is itself an outgrowth of the former. I will probably do another video in the future detailing more deeply the two schools and their differences and similarities. So the influences, both aesthetic and musical on Glass's etudes, are their post-minimalist, uh, there's a continued use of repetitive musical cells as in minimalism, but he expands those and he puts with them a kind of greater fluidity and expression, both melodic and harmonic. Uh, there are some neo-romantic tendencies, which you'll see not just in this particular etude, but in all the etudes. The etudes are rather much more tonal than some of his earlier works and a much greater sense of chromaticism that's used, although, again, never fully common practice. And some of his influences would include composers like Franz Schubert, Sergei Rachmaninoff, and also pop influences as well. Uh, for example, the Beatles, Sting, uh, etc. So the first etude opens with a very strong harmonic chordal progression. Uh, I'm not sure I want to call it progression, but it actually does sound somewhat like a progression. So let's take a listen to that. So we have this strong chord opening. Um, it's somewhat unusual, and we're th basically the work is bracketed by this. We open with this, and then we also we close with this, and then there's a short coda afterwards. So what we have, we begin on an A major chord that basically progresses to a D major chord. Now, in general, the etude is in, it sort of hovers around G minor, so what this would almost appear to be would be some kind of like secondary dominant progression going to the dominant of G minor, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. But also notice the, notice the uh, soprano lines and the bass line. Notice how they're moving in contrary motion. Well, in general, we don't see a lot of that in, in the rest of the etude. We don't see a lot of this sort of um, contrapuntal moving in opposite directions. As a general rule, what we have are a lot of uh, octaves that move together. We end on the firm D major, and then the next thing we have is a broken chord in G minor. And this broken chord pattern is something that we're going to see pretty frequently. After this statement with these broken chords, and the interesting thing about these broken chords is that, and I'm going to come back to them in a moment, but these broken chords basically do contain the germ cell of a melody, and that's going to somewhat remind us a little bit of, of, of Schubert, and like I said, we are going to come back to that. After that, we get pretty much a full-fledged melody, and this melody consists basically of rising and falling scalar lines, suggesting melodic D minor and F major. Let's take a listen to that. Now, the 
these melodies typically show a kind of question and answer kind of structure too. They're dialogical. Uh, for example, if you listen to the D minor melodic scale going up and then going back down, and then to the F major, it sounds as though one is saying something and then one is answering in response. You know, for example, the D minor, it's a soprano line, and then the F major, that is a, it's got a tenor line. So it's like one's responding to the other. This is going to kind of go on for several cycles. That's a very interesting thing. You don't really hear that kind of structure in early in early minimalism. Certainly, it's not there at all. Um, but this is one of the things that makes it a post-minimalist piece. Is it does have these melodic lines and they move in through different voices. Really, uh, they're fairly fluid. As I've noted several times. The harmonic structure, this is not, you know, a traditionally tonal piece, and it does float through the region of G minor for the most part. It it begins with what seems to be a kind of secondary dominant uh, succession to the dominant of G minor, and then we have a G minor broken chord. And then it ends pretty solidly in G minor. Now, although not traditionally tonal, Glass doesn't hesitate to use a, what looks like a 5-6 or 565 to a 1 chord, if, assuming it's in G minor. That said, his central concern seems to be focused on voice leading as the prime mover of harmony. And I think this is perhaps coming from his very early studies with Nadia Boulanger, in which he spent a lot of time and a whole lot of time doing counterpoint. So now the chords he uses are they're primarily simple chords, simple major, minor, and diminished triads. He does use have an effective use of suspensions, especially the nine eight suspension, which we hear here at the end of that first four bar phrase. And there's also a fairly widespread use of mediant relations as well. Now, as I said, Glass embeds melodic fragments within these broken chords, much like Schubert did in, in his compositions. Uh, so, for example, in the B section, what I would call the B section, uh, or the trio, more properly, of, his, of Schubert's impromptu in A-flat major, uh, Opus 142, we hear a very similar kind of melodic and harmonic structure. Not The, harmon the harmony is not the same, but the way the melody is embedded within a kind of broken chord harmonic structure that's very similar to what glass is doing let's take a let's take a listen to that very briefly <laughs> So you can hear how Schubert is basically, there are melodic lines that are occurring within these uh, triplets. You hear something very similar happening in glass as well. So as with many glass pieces, there is a strong reliance on broken chord patterns within a homophonic texture. This is not polyphony. There's a sort of contrapuntal element to how the opening uh, with these you know, big chords that open and sort of close the piece between the soprano and bass, but I would not call that polyphonic. There's still primarily a homophonic texture. Primarily, the chord patterns, the broken chord patterns, are triplets or eighth note accompaniments that are underscored by a strong beat. Basically, is also harkens back to the uh, strong pop music influence that Glass seems to enjoy. So the etude begins and ends with block chords, the last block chord landing firmly on a big G minor chord preceded by a, a D major chord in first inversion. And so it gives it a sense of closure. And then, so these block chords then serve as a bookend for the piece, and then we have a, a final coda that lands firmly on a G minor chord. Glass keeps a tight range on the range of the piano. He's really using mostly the middle registers, uh, with the exception of the final chord. He stays within the range of about A2 to F5, or about two and a half octaves, roughly. Not a very big range. He does use greater dynamic ranges here than in his more classically 
early minimalist works. I compare this with the Metamorphosis from 1988, or even more dramatically with his Canon and Fifths. There's actually quite a bit of dynamic contrast in this work compared with those works. Formally speaking, there is an overall design. However, there are many different ways to approach and analyze this dimension. Uh, from my perspective, I hear that brief melodic line from Rehearsal 5 to Rehearsal 6, basically just a four, four bar phrase, as being kind of an unexpected focal point. We get two variations of that uh, same little theme that's encased between the uh, triplet figures and the melodic figures that act as bookends. So it's almost like there's, I would say this work has the characteristics of a, of a Chinese box. You open one box, and you open another box, and you open another box. It's, it's a work that, that basically has layers to it, and there are layers that are encased within layers. Philip Glass's etudes are a major contribution to the piano repertory in terms of a post-minimalist, you could say kind of a post-minimalist aesthetic statement. And this first etude stands out as a strong beginning to this set. Um, the fact that it's become something of an instant classic leads us naturally to ask certain questions about the work as a whole. Uh, this is a pedagogical piece. Putatively, it's not written as a, quote, object of art. It is written basically as, you know, pedagogical exercises. And uh, we have to remember that that's true for actually almost all of Bach's keyboard works. Bach never regarded most of his keyboard works as works of art, big capital A per se, but rather as exercises for a keyboardist or a composer to learn from, uh, to learn how to play the keyboard more effectively or to learn how to compose more effectively. Yet the aesthetic value of Bach's works are immediately clear. Now, while the same may not hold for, say, a composer such as Carl Czerny or Museo Clementi, their stylistic achievements were still not unrecognized by their contemporaries. And likewise, you know, the romantic etudes of Chopin or uh, those of Paganini for the violin are again part of the standard repertory for those instruments as well. So where does Glass stand uh, with his etudes in terms of musical history and in terms of what he has achieved here? And I think this is a very important question. I do plan to analyze a number of these etudes in the future uh, because I find them fascinating pieces. But I am curious about what is their place in, in musical history, especially being as they've become so incredibly popular in such a short span of time. The uh, composer Kyle Gann remarked in an article on post-minimalism that, quote, I once in an article fantasized about a sentence that might appear in some music history book in the late 21st century. Quote, our current musical language arose in the 1960s and 1970s. In its nascent simplistic state, it was at first mistaken for a full-blown style in itself and was termed minimalism. So this leads us to a question, whether he was correct. Is the style of glass, and I'm speaking here particularly of the etudes and many others, the new classical dominant form? Or is this the common practice of our time? And as I do more analyses of these etudes in the future, I'm going to keep that question in the forefront of my mind and think about them very seriously. And I invite you to think about them as well, because they are, you know, we live in a very diverse musical age. But if there is any composer that seems to you know, be the grandfather of American music, it would be Philip Glass. I mean, again, his success as a composer is, is, is incredible. Thank you very much for staying with me until the end. Please like and subscribe to my channel, and uh, we'll talk with you again soon.